So again, Romans chapter 10, beginning in verse 8. But what does it say? The word is near you, in your mouth, and in your heart. That is the word of faith that we proclaim. Because if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord, and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For with the heart one believes and is justified, and with the mouth one confesses and is saved. For the scripture says, everyone who believes in him will not be put to shame. For there is no distinction between Jew and Greek, for the same Lord is Lord of all, bestowing his riches on all who call on him. For everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Amen. So the connection, the reason I wanted to read verse 8 is, the reason he says this in verse 9 about confessing with your heart and, I mean, confessing with your mouth and believing with your heart is because of what he has said in verse 8, which is a quote from Deuteronomy 30.14. So if we're not going to turn there right now. I mean, you certainly can. It's not too distracting to yourself. Deuteronomy 30.14 is uh, Moses is speaking to the people. We went there last week as we were going through this. And, and he says you know, that the word is near you, is in your mouth and in your heart. And then Paul says, and this is the word of faith that Moses was preaching, that we are proclaiming, and now it's fullness and understanding. And he says then, because if you confess with your mouth, and there's Moses said, in your mouth, and if you believe in your heart, because he said it is in your heart, and this is the word of faith, and Paul says, if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord, believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you will be saved. So this first thing we're going to look at is um, confessing and believing. So this is, you know, the two things that Paul is putting together for us. And we have to be careful that we aren't um, making confessing the faith also a necessary condition for salvation because we believe faith alone. So, okay, faith and confession. And so we have to be careful with that because what can happen is um, you can make the the profession of faith, you can make the, con- the word confession, profession, it's sort of the same thing. We talk about a profession of faith, that you can actually make the profession of faith a work. And a lot of churches not meaning to do this have sort of done this so that people begin to depend on their profession of faith rather than their possession of faith. Now, they'll preach that, and we're not saying that all Presbyterians aren't guilty of it at times as well, because people typically will say it's not your profession of faith, it's your possession of faith. But there is a lot of emphasis and a lot of circles put on that profession of faith. The sinner's prayer, the altar call, things like this. So much so that um, some people will report, um, like they'll have some event, and maybe you know, out of 10,000 people, maybe 1,000 people went forward. And what's the report? 1,000 people got saved. Or you have a, a, like a vacation Bible school and, and you have some sort of an altar call for children. And maybe all 50 children come forward and what do they report? 50 people got saved. Or you'll have a friend who went with you somewhere, went to church. They have an altar call. He went forward. What, and I've had many people come to me and say, hey, he just got saved. And I'm like, what do you mean? Well, he went forward. I said, oh, you mean he made a profession of faith? And they're like, yeah. And so what I want to say is, well, look at it. It means that he's saved. I don't do that. But in my mind, I'm like, how do you possibly approach this in such a way that you aren't undermining the teaching of almost all the church? And also, you're not undermining a guy who may have had an actual conversion experience. But just because somebody went forward at an event, whether it be a worship service or an evangelistic event, a a revival, whatever, it doesn't mean that just because they've professed with their mouths that, that they're saved. And what we will hear a lot is, as well, and the reason I'm, I'm not talking about other people out there, we do this, I'm just saying, check it, because we have to be careful with this. Um, somebody, you know, we've heard, well, they prayed the prayer. Prayed the prayer. And you know what I mean? If you're in our culture, you know, they prayed the prayer. What prayer? You talking about the Lord's prayer? They prayed the Lord's prayer? No, 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 they prayed the sinner's prayer. They confess with their mouth, maybe Jesus is Lord. And the question is, well, if they really, what they'll say is, yeah, you can't just say this in a prayer, you have to really mean it. 
So you have to, so then it becomes not just my profession, but I do have to believe in my heart that Jesus is the Lord. But have you ever professed something boldly and proudly and fervently and maybe even would have put your right hand to the Bible and said it's true and then later figure out, like, okay, maybe I was kind of wrong about that thing. Um, maybe I shouldn't have been quite so zealous about, uh, you know, I don't know, I hate that. Greenpeace is coming to my mind for some reason. I don't know what they're doing these days. But, you know, you might have some organization. And you're like, this is the best organization in the world, and you're getting everybody to come to it. And then later on, you figure out, it's like, okay, maybe that wasn't the best organization to be a part of. But you believed it with your heart, but you changed your mind. And so there are a lot of people who come to Christ with all their heart. But it's temporary, and the Bible teaches about the, the seed that's cast out, and it's the soil that's different. So... You know, the question is, on what do we base our confidence and assurance that we're saved? And that's what really Paul is, is saying here. There's two things that are going on with Paul. He's saying that, that we do have a duty to confess our faith. That um, faith, um, <clears throat> if, if you confess your faith, but uh, if it's just an empty confession, it doesn't mean anything. I mean, you do have to actually believe and when he says with your heart, he's not saying it's just emotional. It means you just, it's like things that you believe with your heart, you just know it to be true. And this is what he's getting at here. And also that faith is the necessary condition for salvation. Um, true faith is from the heart, and that faith will produce a profession of faith. It will produce a confession of faith. But we have to be very careful not to be relying on these professions of faith because what we can do as little evangelists or we can do as, um, you know, depending on how do I know I'm saved or, or what other people do when they're trying to put together evangelistic services or things, it's like we got to get that, that profession of faith. You know, if you're talking to somebody about the Lord, I remember doing this early on, just trying to get the person to go, yes, I believe. I, you know, now I've, you know, get them to confess it. And, um, and I've heard it, somebody say, you know, get me in a room alone with somebody for 10 minutes and I'll get a confession out of them. <laughs> you know, it's like, yeah, I don't think that's exactly what we're trying to do. But that is what can happen because I've been in worship services that were highly emotionally manipulative. Speaking in tongues, it, now it begins. Manipulative. Gosh. So yeah, manipulative. Yes. <laughs> emotionally manipulative can't say it. And then you're sitting there in the pew. I remember sitting there in the pew. It's like, let go of the pew. You know, they're saying it from the pulpit. It's like, if you don't come forward today and you leave and you get in your car and you die, you will go to hell if you don't come forward and profess Christ. And I remember holding on to that pew and going, ah, I'll probably make it another week. <laughs> just like, just didn't want to go forward. But I know looking back in my mind, I'm pretty sure I had faith at that point. I was saved. But in the tradition, you had to go forward. Now, the, when I first went to Presbyterian Church, I asked the pastor after the service at some point, and we were talking about church, and I said, well, how do people get saved? He said, what do you mean? I said, well, how do people get saved? He said, well, they put their faith and trust in Jesus Christ. They claim. And I said, yeah, but you don't do it. He said, oh, the altar call. I was like, yeah, you can do an altar call at the end. How do people get saved? Because, and you have to remember this, that in some traditions, it is such, it, it, the, the, the salvation experience comes with a, with a set of events. And if you don't have those things that happen in those set events, then the, 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 it throws them all off. So if somebody comes into this church and we don't have an altar call, although a lot of Baptists are even getting away from altar calls and center prayers now, but if you... If they were coming in here and we don't have an altar call, I mean, they might very well leave thinking, how does one get saved? So what we're going to start doing are altar calls and, and prayers. But no, I'm not going to do that. Because you know what they do? There's some people that come in and they love altar call. Oh, my goodness, they live for an altar call. I'm going to bust up in there. I'll pray. You know, it's like, quit, you're like a Pharisee. Pharisees love that kind of thing. Praying in public, jumping up and, you know, doing all this thing. It's a work. Any work you can give me to show me, show the world and to make me feel like I'm really, really, really a good Christian and I'm awesome. Give me the list and give me the clothes and give me that thing and I'll do it. And then you have confidence in that thing you did. And what Paul is saying here is like, listen, Jew, Gentile. All have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. He's made that point. 
Now he's making this other point. Jew, Gentile. Grace is open to all. But only in Jesus Christ. And only in Jesus Christ and Lord. Not just with a mere profession, but with a belief in the heart. But as Moses taught, if you confess with your mouth and you believe in your heart, then not just any profession or any confession, but that we actually have a content to it. And we're going to look at that in just a second. But whenever I hear somebody who's talking about somebody who got saved, we have to remember that the Bible does not teach what's been called decisional regeneration. So um, decisional regeneration means I made a decision for Christ and therefore I am regenerated. Okay, so I'm a sinner. I make a decision. I get saved. Okay, we understand the Bible teaches differently than that, that the Holy Spirit does something in our hearts. The Holy Spirit comes to us. He calls us. We've seen in Paul, he elects us unto faith, and we hear the gospel call, and we respond because of the Holy Spirit's work within us, and the response is from faith to faith, and it is a profession of what? And this is what Paul is is getting at here, because what we really want to also understand is not just, am I really saved, but the perseverance of the believers, the perseverance of the saints. What about you know, I've heard somebody say, what have you done for me lately kind of thing. If, if you can make a vow with God and you come into his presence and you are baptized covenantally, you receive the covenant sign of baptism, and then you continue in your faith, you, you take the covenantal meal of the Lord's Supper and you, for years maybe, and then you walk away. Or maybe you just came forward and did the altar call or whatever it was you did, you got baptized and then you're gone, you're out. You got your, I like to call it, I've heard other people call it too, your get out of hell free card. You know, where is that thing? I'm dead somewhere. Where did I put that thing? Somewhere. And, you know, here it is. But if your marriage is a vow to, you don't make a contract, it's a covenant. And so when your covenant to your spouse, hesed love, covenanted, promised love, what you're not doing is saying, hey, I'm going to get married. And then maybe, you know, for a week or two, that's awesome. Honeymoon's over. Now, I don't know, I'm out. You know, and then your wife is like, or your husband is like, well, where is he? Where is she? What's going on? I mean, that's no marriage. You're not fulfilling your covenant vows. But we'll oftentimes see people that treat church like that because it doesn't matter where they are. They can worship God anywhere. Well, I guess you could pull out the picture of your wife and look at it wherever you may be and say, gosh, I sure love my wife. Where is she? Oh, I don't know. I haven't seen her in months. Like, no, I don't think you're in a relationship with your wife. It's about a relationship, and that's a big thing in you know, our day, too, is you have to have a relationship with God. It's like, yeah, but you have to have actual factual content. So the perseverance of the saints would have us to ask ourselves, where is your faith today? Where are you today? Okay, tell me what you did 20 years ago. You made a profession of faith. I've been to a funeral where a guy was, like, living in such a way that, well, at that time, he was dead. But before, he had been living in such a way that it was like notoriously not a believer. And then the pastor at the funeral says, well, I know he's in heaven because I remember 40 years ago, he made a profession of faith and got saved. And so, I mean, if, if, listen, if you didn't know much, you would just sit in the congregation and go, hey, I did that too. Or I can go do that. But that's not... The question, the question to everybody should be, what do you believe right now? Are you trusting in him right now? Do you believe you're going to trust in him tomorrow? Are you going to follow him all the way? Are you going to, to, um, to trust in him? It's not just a one-time decision we make. And so we, I think sometimes we worry. It's like, well, if it's not like that, how do I know I'm going to be saved a year from now? And on the one hand, you might say, well, if you're saved now, you're always saved. I mean, God will hold you to that. But God doesn't, I mean, God will hold you in that. But what happens is sometimes preachers or teachers are trying to comfort people. And, you know, we don't want them to have this uh, lack of confidence in their salvation, fear of it. And we want to give them that confidence in the, that you will always be a believer. So we just tell them as long as you were sincere at one point. It's like, but you have no way of knowing how sincere you were. How sincere must you be? You know, did I really believe in my heart? Was it something I just did because as lots of non-believers will make profession? 
And so the question is, every day, are we trusting in the promises of God? Will I trust in the promises of tomorrow? Paul says, I finished the race. I fought the good fight. I, you know, he's like, I know. I'm persevering in my faith. It's what the church is for. It's what the Bible is for. It's what the Holy Spirit, the Lord's Supper, these things are for. You need me. He gives us the Lord's Supper. How long are you going to go if you don't eat food? What is it like? You know, not long. <laughs> they, they, you, I mean, a lot of people go a long time, but eventually you're out. And if you don't eat consistently, you got some problems. I know we have this intermittent fasting, but that word intermittent is a funny thing. You know, it's not like I only eat like once a month or so. You know, so with the Lord's Supper, it's a reminder that you need to hear the gospel. You need to consume the gospel. You need to live in the gospel. You need to abide in me. You need to constantly be thinking about these things. Not that because if you're saved, you'll lose your salvation. But if you're saved, you'll become a weaker and weaker and weaker and weaker and weaker and weaker and and emaciated looking Christian. That the world would have to look at and go, I don't know. And then you should have to look at and go, where's my confidence? But it could very well be that you didn't really have a real faith. I think we should think about, do I, is my faith real? Right this second, is it real? Are you trusting in it? I've used it several times. You know the chair will hold you up, but are you sitting in it? Are you resting in it? You might say, I know Christ is a Savior. I know Christ is a God, but am I resting in him? Am I trusting in him? Am I loving him? And the question to a lot of these things are going to be, not enough. Not enough. Am I loving him enough? Am I trusting him enough? Am I going to church enough? Am I, and the answer to that is going to be, no. You need to love him more. You need to have faith in him more. You need to put more confidence in him. But here's the thing. He holds us. We're not in a covenant of works. We're in a covenant of grace. Amen, hallelujah. You just have to be like, thank you, God, that you save a wretch like me. That the, that the good news, restore to me the joy of my salvation, is what David said when he had been called up in, in sin. So, so we need that. With the confidence that at times when you feel you're doing poorly and you're in a valley of the shadow of death, and if I had to go on my experience at that particular time, in that particular moment, whether I'm saved or not, I'd go like, I don't know, and Satan could come at me, and the flesh can come at me, and the world can come at me and make me doubt my salvation. But I'd have to say at that particular point, I know the one who holds my hand. Jesus on the cross, abandoned by God, says, quote scripture, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Or does Scripture quote him in the Psalms? And so, we trust in his ability to hold us. Because we're talking about, second point here, faith's content. Your faith has to be in the right thing. You must believe in the true Christ. You may trust a tree branch. It's going to hold you up. You're falling down um, a, a a cliff, you see a branch, you, 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 do you trust it's going to, I mean, you got to leap to it, and you think you can do it. It's like, and I'm trusting in that branch is going to hold me, but if you don't think it's going to hold you, you're never going to do it, but if you trust that it is, you'll jump to it to save your life, or at least your legs, and so you, you grab the branch. Now the question is, were you right to trust in it? Because it has nothing at that point to do with your trust. It has to do with what you trusted in. Was your confidence right to be placed in that branch? And if the branch can't hold you up, you can have all the faith in the world that it was, and down you go. Now, how much faith would it take for you to jump to that branch that you're not sure is going to hold you up? Well, it depends on the fall. It depends on, is it the only thing left at times? But it's an imperfect analogy because what The branch that we believe in, in Christ Jesus, sends his Holy Spirit to us and says, jump, grab me, trust me. I am the good shepherd. I am the rock. I am your savior. Yeshua, Oshana, it means save us. And he is our savior. And we believe in him. Acts 4.12 says, there is salvation in no one else. For there is no name under heaven given among men by which you must be saved. John 14, 6 says, Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one can come to the Father except through me. So this is the exclusive claim of Christianity that there is no salvation apart from Jesus Christ. You must, your confession must be in him. Any other confession that you have for salvation, whatever it may be, will not hold you. And then in Romans 10, 11, and 12, the beginning of 
verse 12, we read, For there is no distinction between Jew and Greek, for the same Lord is Lord of all. So this is salvation's extent, this third point, that everyone who believes, some translations say whosoever believes, um, Jew or Gentile, um, because he's also previously written about God's election of sovereign grace and uh, the sovereignty of God over who the elect are, and Paul makes it clear here that everyone who believes in Christ will not be put to shame. And that's a quote from Isaiah 28, 16. The prophets have said these things as well. And then um, in Isaiah, the hymn is Yahweh, the Lord, God. So whoever is believing in Yahweh shall not be saved. We say the Lord, you'll see in your Bibles, uh, the, you know, the capital L and then the little O-R-D capitals. That's the Tetragrammaton. It's called the four-lettered name of God, yod heh vav He, Yahweh. We kind of say it these days. Um, but that it, he's the Lord. And he's the Lord of all people. He's the Lord of all things. And for everyone who calls upon the name of the Lord will be saved. So finally, I'm going to look at the name of the Lord. And so let's look at Joel chapter 2. So Joel's prophets, see if you can find it there. So you just, you get the Psalms, you go to the right. Isaiah and Jeremiah are, are large books, and then Ezekiel's pretty big, and you just kind of keep going. Ezekiel, Daniel, Hosea. I should have brushed up on my minor, minor prophets as well. This is when... I was supposed to remember to put my um, bookmark in here so that I could look good. Like, look at, look, he, he can find Joel right away. All right, I got there. Have you all beaten me to that place yet? Joel chapter 2, this verses 30 and 32. And Joel says, I will show wonders in the heavens and on the earth, blood and fire and columns of smoke. The sun shall be turned to darkness and the moon to blood before the great and awesome day of Yahweh comes. It's judgment. It's the okay, day of the Lord. And it shall come to pass. So yeah, the prophets typically give this hope. And it shall come to pass. Everyone who calls on the name of who? In the Greek, you're reading this thing, Yahweh. Now, the Jews, for later on, they decided that um, we don't want to take the Lord's name in vain. We don't take Yahweh's name in vain. So instead of saying Yahweh, they say Adonai, which is Lord. And so what the English Bible translators did very early on is they translated the word Yahweh as Lord. So that if Jewish people were reading their Old Testament, this wouldn't be offensive to them. And it's typically how they would read it. So they use the word Lord. Now you have newer translations. What is it? The Legacy Standard Bible uses the word Yahweh. So you'll see that in your New Testament as well. But this is an important point to understand. Because remember, verse 32, It shall come to pass, everyone who calls on the name of Yahweh shall be saved. For in Mount Zion and in Jerusalem there shall be those who escape, as Yahweh has said. And among the survivors shall be those whom Yahweh calls. So see what he does there? So those who call upon the name of Yahweh shall be saved. And who's going to escape? Those who Yahweh calls. So which comes first? And it's the calling of the Lord. And what do we do? We call upon the name of the Lord. We call upon the name of Yahweh. So then we go back to Romans 10, 9. And we read, If you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord. In, in Hebrew, it says you confess kurios, Jesus. You confess the Lord Jesus, which is interesting, too, because he doesn't say Christos, Kyrios. He doesn't say, uh, he doesn't say um, Jesus, Christos. He doesn't say Jesus Christ or Christ. Christ is the anointed one. Christ is the king. But here, specifically, he says that you confess Lord Jesus. Lord Jesus. So anytime you call Jesus Lord, for Jews, that comes perilously close to calling him God because that's when we see Yahweh, we say Lord, and you're calling Jesus Lord. And I'm sure they would look and say, just be careful with that. That's kind of far. But here, Paul is making this point that we're supposed to confess with our mouth that Jesus is 
Yahweh. That's what he's saying because he's quoting the Old Testament, which says, this is talking about calling on Yahweh. You're going to call on Yahweh's name? You know who we're going to call on? Jesus. The Son is Yahweh. The Father is Yahweh. The Holy Spirit is Yahweh. This is the Lord. This is the God of the Old Testament. And we see Jesus is being called the Lord here. Jesus Christ is our King and our Savior. But he's also Lord. And he's Lord of all. So let's just look at a few places before we close here and see, unpack this just a minute. Colossians. So this is New Testament. Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians. Chapter 2, beginning in verse 6. Colossians 2, 6. Therefore, as you received Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk in him, rooted and built up in him, and established in the faith, just as you were taught, abounding in thanksgiving. So this is what we're called to do. Not just have a profession, not just say something, but to be rooted and built up and established in this faith that we're taught. And we're abounding in thanksgiving. See to it that no one takes you captive by philosophy or empty deceit according to human tradition, according to elemental spirits of the world, and not according to Christ. For in him the whole fullness of deity of God dwells bodily. And you have been filled in him who is the head of all rule and authority. In him, this is all Jesus, also you were circumcised with a circumcision made without hands by the putting off of the body of the flesh, by the circumcision of Christ, having been buried with him in baptism. There's your connection between circumcision and baptism, by the way, in which you were raised with him through faith in the powerful working of God who raised him from the dead. So we are united to Christ in his resurrection, which is a major point of Easter. And you were dead in your trespasses and the uncircumcision of your flesh. God made alive together with him, having forgiven all our trespasses by canceling the record of debt that stood against us with its legal demands. This he set aside, and I love this imagery, nailing it to the cross. So if we're going to have a cross, the Catholic Church puts Jesus on it. And we're like, no, the reformers are like, no. They don't like images of Christ to start with. He's not on the cross. He's at the right hand of God the Father. He's no longer there. But if there's anything on the cross, it is the record that stands against us. So if Jesus wants to be God, if Satan comes to us and he says, but you're a sinner and you cannot be saved. We're like, have you looked at the cross lately? You nailed Jesus to it, but what's there now? The record against me, nailed to the cross. And so it's beautiful. He disarmed the rulers and authorities. There's these demonic powers, all these people there against us, all these beings against us. And he put them to open shame by triumphing over them in Christ. So there's this triumphal warrior. And then we look at 1 Peter chapter 3.21. So we go past Hebrews and James, you get to 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 21. Again, it just coincidentally is talking about baptism, but it makes these points. <clears throat> baptism, which corresponds to this, um, talking about Noah being saved through the flood, and I always like to point out those who were sprinkled were saved, those who were immersed were not, but here we are, you're, you're, you're saved by the faith of 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 Noah, if you're on the ark. So baptism, which now corresponds to this, now saves you, not as a removal of dirt from the body, but as an appeal to God for a good conscience through the resurrection of Jesus Christ, who has gone into heaven and is at the right hand of God with angels, authorities, and powers having been subjected to him. Okay, so this is important. When we're calling Jesus Lord, this is what we're saying. OK, they have been subjected to him. And that's awesome. And then we go to Philippians 2, which I go to a lot when we're talking about the exaltation of Christ. So Philippians chapter 2, beginning of verse 8. So Jesus being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross and therefore, God has highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name that is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord 
to the glory of God the Father. Jesus Christ is Lord. This is our profession, that we believe Jesus Christ is Lord. And so we ask, do you confess Jesus Christ as Lord? Do you believe in Jesus Christ as Lord? And so then I could say, and would like to say, then live like it. But then I put you back under the covenant of works. Because if you really believe it, what are you doing? And there's some truth in there. But, as the Bible says, work out your salvation. Have an outworking of it with fear and trembling. Because I believe God would have us to respond to this if we're confessing Jesus as Lord and believing as Jesus and Lord. That if you believe these things, then believe like it. I think that's the thing. It's not what we're doing. That just kind of results from what you believe. And you can fix all that and your belief just, I don't know what have you, start to have confidence in that. Just believe that he's Lord. And confess with your mouth that, that God raised him from the dead. I mean, that means everything. He died, he raised, God did these things. There's a confession. We believe there are things, content that we believe about God that the Bible teaches and we believe it. And we confess it and we believe it with our hearts, but we need to believe it, rest in him, trust in him. He is Lord of heaven and earth. He has the keys of, of death in Hades. He has conquered death and the grave. And when we say next week, he is risen. He is risen indeed. That's a big thing. Somewhere they started this a long time ago. He is risen. He is risen indeed. And we confess that and we'll say that on Easter and you'll see everybody. He is risen. He is risen. But goodness sakes, come on, please. He is risen every day of the week, every moment of the day. He is risen. He has been risen. He has been risen for all time. He is risen. It's not just Easter that we're going to confess this. I love sunrise service because it helps you remember and put yourself. It's like you're in a little children's sermon. It's cold and it's, it's, it's dark. And it's like you see the sun start to come up and you're like, oh, I got to go. And then he's all Always think about what were they doing that morning when they were going to the tomb. They were like, Jesus, their Savior, their brother, their friend, their one they loved and were trusting in and thought he was he's dead and they're going to go prepare his body. That is not the gruesome task that you want to have to do when you wake up in the morning. And that's what they were going to do. And then they get there and they experience the gospel. They experience it for the first time. It's like, What? It's like, it's like, we've been telling you. The disciples go hide in their upper room, and all of a sudden the Holy Spirit, Jesus appears to them. The Holy Spirit appears at Pentecost. All these things are happening and everything, and it's just like, and when the Holy Spirit descends, it's just like, okay, everything he taught was true. I didn't even hear it at the time, and now I see it. I was blind, and now I see. Even walking with Jesus without the Holy Spirit being poured into our hearts, even Peter, he says, Peter, who do you say I am? He says, you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. And he says, flesh and blood didn't reveal this to you, but my Father who is in heaven revealed this to you. It's a supernatural event for you to get that, even with me standing in front of you. Because he stood in front of a bunch of people and they crucified him. And so you might stand in front. The church will stand in front of a bunch of people. And they just assume cru crucify us. But there are those that the Lord is calling to himself. And as we confess with our mouth that Jesus is Lord, and we begin to live our lives out of our faith in these things, the Lord calls people to himself. So we must believe Hosanna. He saves. He saved a wretch like me. He is Lord. He is Lord of this table. He is lavishing the riches of his grace to us as we hear the gospel, as we trust in him, as we come to the table. The same power that raised Jesus from the dead is at work in us and is present in this gospel and in this meal that we're about to partake in. He is Lord of all. He holds us in his hand and nothing and no one can snatch us away out of his hand because nothing can separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus. Amen. Amen. Father God, we thank you. Pray you help us to cling to you more tightly. And we know that hard things happen and a lot of times they happen to cause us to cling tightly. Um, sometimes things happen because things happen. But you're at work in all these things. Nothing happens because you're not powerful. Nothing happens because Satan just won this victory. It happens because you're a sovereign God and we're trusting. We live in a fallen world in which evil and there's a prince of the power of the air and these people worship a God that, has, that is Satan. So we pray that as we stand against these things, we proclaim your gospel. We proclaim that your kingdom will come and that your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. We thank you that you're calling people to yourself even as you continue to call us 
and hold us tight. We pray this in Christ's name. Amen.